special guest, Mr. Josh Balin. I feel like whenever I say Mr., it feels like I'm a kid again. Like, oh, Mr. or Mrs. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm only 43 years old, so like I don't really go by Mr. yet. <laughs> Mr. I don't know, you know, I don't even know why I said Mr. This is this is fun. This is why I do this. So you never know what's gonna happen. But uh Josh, where are you from? Um, what part of the country are you from? Let's let's start off there. So yeah, my name is Jason Balin from Hard Money Bankers. Um in uh the Washington DC, Baltimore area. Born and raised here, moved out a little bit for college and to see Colorado and some other places of the country you know, in my early 20s, and then ventured back here, because I had an entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, ha- had, you know, boots on the ground and knew people here locally that I didn't have connections and relationships with in other parts of the, the country. And, you know, dabbled around in lots of different areas of real estate early on real estate agent, mortgage broker, uh, flipping houses, buying rental properties, things like that. And, you know, eventually s- uh, settled and I use the word settled, which isn't probably the right word, because it seems like, hey, you're just going to settle for something. But I was ambitious to uh, start and grow Hard Money Bankers, which is a private lending company, uh, focusing on doing loans for real estate investors and commercial property owners in 2007. And yeah, you know, fast forward 17, 16, 17 years, uh, we're still thriving and growing and, you know, kind of doing good business and met a lot of great uh, real estate investors and business owners along the way. So um, my my brother lives in Dumfries, so I've been over there a few times in that area. Yep. It is crazy the traffic there. Yeah, I mean I'm north, so you know Dumfries is a suburb of Washington D.C. Uh, yeah. in in Virginia, and it's just it's south of Washington D.C. I'm north of Washington D.C. between uh, D.C. and Baltimore, kind of smack into the middle. So I actually. You know, bo- both of those are pretty major markets, and they somewhat blend together. But I'm in a, ha- in a county called Howard County, which my office is in, which I try not to leave if I don't need to. And yeah. I don't have, you know, there's not a lot of traffic, there's not as much congestion, and it makes my life a little bit easier. There you go. Um, one thing I, lo- I love about this is you've been doing this for a very, very long time. Absolutely. Long time. Um, so you started in 2007, that we said. Yep, we closed our first loan through our uh, private lending company in 07. Wow. Right at the bottom, right, right at the bottom of the market, kind of right where it was like all going down and you weren't really sure. I mean, the bottom was probably 08, but you never know when the top and the bottom, you never know where you are in the market. So that's yeah. in hindsight, you, you kind of, I kind of saw that. So I have some, I have some early on questions because I, I, ta- I just interviewed a guy last week and he killed it, literally killed it during 08 to 12 time period um was that like a huge acceleration point for yourself during that time as far as business goes so so it's a good question and not really and the reason why is you you know you don't know what you don't know in real time Mm -hmm. um and we didn't really have any of our own capital when when we started a our lending company and you know, we all, we all started with nothing. Yeah. And and, and it's kind of funny to say that it's like, how do you start a lending company? You don't have any of your own capital. So we were, you know, out there raising capital. We were out there looking for deals to lend on on a regular basis. And we talk about this all the time. Like if there's a time in the market and we're able to see it and it's similar to those times, I believe we could absolutely kill it and accelerate, you know, with our own capital, capital that we control, just resources that we have today, but I didn't have those back then. And we were very, very cautious. You know, if, if anyone's, you know, watching or listening, who's ever raised capital, like you're, especially early on, like you're terrified to potentially mismanage or lose that capital. Absolutely. And that's kind of how we were early on. So, you know, we look back at deals that we potentially passed on that you know, 10 X in value in the last 15 years. And, you know, that might sound extreme, but there's some areas of the country that that's happened to, especially in some areas around here. Um, and that is, you know, that just is what it is. Like we were very, very cautious and, you know, we didn't even have like a late payment for the first four or five years because we were just, we, you know, we didn't know we, we try to write the best of the best deal, deals, but I think it gave us a really good basis to, uh, to, to start with, but yes, it was, it, it the, the good part about starting back then was you know the stock market had just crashed so when we were raising capital from you know high net worth individuals and things like that you know they wanted an alternative uh, than to put their mar- their money in the market and 
you know, there was no really private capital out there besides just kind of mom and pop. There's no institutional capital out there. Banks weren't really lending. So we did really have the upper hand to do so. So yeah. it did make it a little bit easier that like, this is what our terms are. I mean, back then pricing 15%, five points, you know, which is a lot, you know, who, you know, who knows, maybe it goes back to that in the future as rates, <laughs> if rates continue to go up, but they're, you know, they, it's gone down since that with, with pricing. Um, so there was definitely some pros from doing that, but I think just like any, any time there's always, it's always a good time to start and there's always advantages and disadvantages of every market. So, and I, I really want to dig in on that. Um, a lot of people are like, I think some people, there's like the, you have like the opposite side, like you have people that are too scared to jump in and you have the people who are like, who I'll figure it out. Like running, running through the front lines type person. Yeah. Um, and I, I think when you first start, I think it's, it's one of those things where like you have to be cautious. And I, I, I can understand being protective of, of your little investment capital that you had at the time. You got to be a, a steward of that, a fiduciary of that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's as you grow, you've, you've let, you kind of let go of that. Not that you're not as cautious, but you kind of let go of like, Hey, I'm doing good things. I know what I'm doing. Let me kind of release some pressure because the pressure is yeah. immense. <laughs> no pressure. doubt um so let's talk about um raising private capital um let's talk about you, i think you, you have an advantage because you've done this through multiple different swings so let's talk about raising capital in terrible markets versus good markets and what the sure. difference is like and go, what terms are they requiring because i think go, you've done both so absolutely so go, going back real quick to what you said earlier like we just call that internally the uh education versus execution phase like the seesaw okay. like and I think I know you know where I'm getting at with that, but like yeah. some people are just so educated, but they'll never get off the, they'll never do a deal, and other people just want to go out and and execute, but then they're really dangerous because they don't know what the hell they're doing, and they can you know lose houses, lose people's money, stuff stuff like that. But anyways, related to raising capital, so you know here's the interesting part about raising capital is usually usually everyone thinks they just have to go out and they're scared to go find a deal until they have the capital lined up. Like, and I get it. It makes it, and it make it, it makes sense. And we were like that as well. You know, we came from my business partner, Chris had, and I came from like a mortgage background and we, we had some real estate or we were investing in some real estate. We weren't all that good at it, but like we knew real estate investors and things. So like, we were like, we have deals. Like we know people that want capital. Everyone needs capital. We just don't have any, we don't even have any of the capital. So, you know, surprising to surprisingly when we went out and we chatted with, and and none of the money early on came from really family or or direct friends. They came from like a friend of a friend or a friend of a colleague or something like that. That's usually where it would it would start with. And you know, again, we were in like our mid to late twenties at at this time. You know, didn't exactly know how to how to raise capital. But what ended up happening is everyone we talked to, in essence, was like, yeah, I mean, that made sense. It ma makes sense. You're willing to give me a high rate of return, you know, a double digit interest rate of return. I'm potentially collateralized by, by a first uh, position uh, and a first mortgage on investment real estate. It, like it was, I don't want to say it was like a hundred percent closing ratio, but it was, but like verbally it was pretty high because everyone's like, yeah, like that's a no brainer. Like who wouldn't do that type of deal, right? Yeah. Go find me the deal. And we're like, okay. And then when we actually went to go look out, look for deals that we thought were going to be easy to find, they, they really weren't, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that there wasn't like, you know, potential borrowers out there that were looking for, you know, high leverage and cheap terms and didn't have good credit. Like, just because somebody wants capital doesn't mean you're going to give it to them, right? Just because a seller wants to sell you a, pro a property doesn't mean that you're going to want to buy it, right? So like, we had, we learned that we had to weed through a tons and tons and tons of deals and opportunities before we can find the good ones. But then as we found the good ones, we realized that the capital is very, very easy to to use because like we you know a month later we go back to that capital investor and say hey so i found this deal the borrower is buying it for a hundred thousand dollars and needs fifty thousand dollars in renovations it's going to be worth you know whatever two hundred thousand dollars call it and we're going to lend this amount of money and they're going to you know we were really cautious like i was saying early on we were really cautious on stuff we're mm -hmm. going to lend you know a hundred thousand dollars with fifty thousand held back so the borrower is going to need to bring fifty thousand dollars to the table plus closing costs which sounds crazy right but like you know, again, you want to do the best of the best deals, especially early on to get to get some traction. And they were like, yeah, this is a no brainer. Like, why don't they just go to the bank? And our answers were like, well, banks aren't really lending to real estate investors currently. Like they're, they, they're just not. And that's what was going on at that time. 
So we created a track record of finding really, really good opportunities. And I'm like a big advocate of anyone who has a good deal, like a really, really good deal. Like you should never have the problem. You should never have a hard time getting the capital for that deal. It might not be at the terms that you necessarily want, but go. like the capital is available between private money and hard money and banks and HELOCs and JV partnerships and things like that. And I mean, I look at deals all day long and, you know, someone might not want to pay us 13% interest rate and three points. And I get it. Like that might not work, but like that is an option, right? There's, so there's always different capital out there. So, we, you know, again, what we ended up building and it stays like this today is just in essence, like a front end marketing machine to just try to get as many opportunities as we can and, you know, find the best of the best of the best of the best deals, knowing that like, if you do a bad deal, there's so much stuff that can go wrong, right? The deal, you know, the deal goes, no, the deal goes bad. Potentially it's a headache. You got to, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a loan or a purchase and you're buying it yourself. It doesn't really matter if you, if you do it, it goes headache and you go, you know, goes over budget, then you got to put some more money in then you got to do this. Then you, you know, and that's all just like on the front end, that doesn't include your capital investors. You know, if you're raising capital behind that, then all of a sudden, like on a lender. So let's say I'm acting as, as the lender, I got to go foreclose on the property, but then I got a, a capital investor on the back end who's pissed off because they're not getting monthly payments. And then potentially they might even want to try to sue me because they might not get their money back. So like, it's hard enough to default, you know, a deal on the front end, then you got to deal with a capital investor and then they tell their friends and then it's a small niche community and then you're out of business. So, so like it all stems from having a good deal on the front end to be able to put, different capital sources in your capital stack on the back end. And I don't think it's just for a lending company. I think that's for an operator as well, right? Like you buy your first fix and flip and you lose money and potentially like you have a capital investor who's like, Hey, what's going on with this? Why haven't you given me my return? You know? And then you, then they realize a loss. You'll probably just be out of the business. You would probably just give up. Be like, this sucked. Like this was a lot of pressure. I couldn't sleep at night. So all of it stems from a good opportunity on the front end. So I want to break down a couple of things. So I like I like this conversation. I like this direction because a lot of wholesalers and a lot of buyers don't understand the lender's responsibility and the lender's role in the transaction. And we have and carry our own liability whenever we're bringing private capital into a transaction. So it has to, and I, I tell my, I tell students all the time, like you have to find and negotiate better deals because we have to we we if we're bringing the capital have to protect our lenders. We have to. We yep. have to. That's the bottom line. Like, I don't care what your assignment fee is. We have to protect the lender's capital. That's paramount on every transaction. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so it's one of those things where um, a lot of wholesalers don't understand that, especially if they're new. They don't understand the, the capital stack and buying at good margins and and what what is. What is mar what is real margin of safety? And I think it's great that you're early on you were asking for a large down payment. I mean, people fifty cent if you're fifty cents on the dollar loan to value, I mean you're 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 doing all right in a great position if you ever have to default and clean up that mess. Yeah. And and it might not listen, and it might not work for people, and I get it, but like, you know, you gotta start kind of so you kind of gotta start somewhere. I mean, everyone will do the best deals that they have in front of them at any given time, right? If I show you 10 deals, you're gonna pick the the number one deal out of all of them to do. And, but if I show you a hundred deals or a thousand deals, chances are, you're probably gonna have a better deal that you can choose from. And that's why it's all about the front end marketing machine. Like I look at thousands, you know, between myself and I have partners that run some other local offices for us. Like we're looking at thousands of deals a month to close 25 of them collectively. You know, I know lenders across the country. And I know real estate investors across the country that like look at a few deals <laughs> and they're picking one of them to do. So again, that's not to mean that like, and, and let's be honest, if you did, a, if you do a bad deal, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to work out. Like yeah. looking back, I've done deals that we've scraped by that we've been able to, you know, the market's helped over the last 10 years. That's one thing, you know, as an operator, you know, we've got lucky on some stuff, you know, we purchased properties and we ended up making more money than we expected. Or, you know, we're like, oh my God, this was, this thing's crappy. And we just scraped out. So like, just because you don't do a good deal doesn't mean like the point is to do good deals, but also as you grow as a business owner, real estate investor, an entrepreneur is you got to get better at it. Right. I think the worst thing that every person that made money in real estate over the last five, eight, 10 years have done 
is doing skinny margin, marginal deals, and the market's continuing to grow up, and they've been making money that way, and they actually don't even have a business, and they don't even know really what they're doing, because it's like, oh, I just went on MLS, and I found a deal, and I flipped it, I made money. And it's like, you're all out of business now, because like that stuff is hard. That's the stuff, not that it doesn't exist, but it's hard to, to do as things change. So, you know, I look at it as, hey, if, if, if a good thing's going, learn from it and make it better and better and better and better. Um, and again, like I got lucky on early on deals because even if I was super conservative, the market still helped, right? Like if a, if a property is worth a hundred today and worth $200,000 tomorrow, you could completely shit the bed. You can completely, you know, screw up on construction. Your contractors can steal from you and you'll still make money on the deal, but you got to use that as a learning tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you more of a underwrite the deal versus the person or are you kind of weigh them equally? So everything we do internally, we follow this to a T. Four C's, collateral being top priority, collateral being most important, and then character being the second most important. Um, and then capacity, you know, they have the ability to do the deal and then credit, you know, so they all are an intricate part, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's definitely a piece of collateral that we're, that we're comfortable lending on. And again, like credit is in there, but it's not the most important thing. I want to make sure the, the borrower has good character and has the ability to do that because I'll tell you from from experience over and over and over, a crappy character borrower will bring down a good deal at any time. And I could give, a you know, and, and someone could do a real marginal, not great deal, but they have great character and they'll figure out a way to make it work and they'll figure out a way to pay us back. So on a lending side, that's super important. So collateral character and capacity, uh, capacity. Yeah. Capacity and credit. So like, do they have down payment money? Do they have the ability to do a construction project? If it's your first project, it's kind of hard to do a $165,000 construction project in like a major city where the buildings were built in the forties or the fifties, because there's so many unknowns. You don't have the resources. You don't have the permits in Washington DC. It could take you 12 months to get a permit. Right. So if there's a newbie real estate investor that, you know, is, has a good deal. They have good character. They have a lot of cash they're willing to put into the deal. They still, that still might not be the best fit for them at this time, just because they don't have the resources. They, they don't have an expediter that can help push permits through the city. They, they, you just don't know what you don't know. You know, a deal that, that might be in the suburbs where it's like a lipstick on a pig project or, you know, something that's a little bit more manageable, uh, you know, might, might be right, be right for them. And, you know, on that topic, I know there was a time and, I, and this still might happen that a lot of like the institutional capital of the world, the institutional hard money lenders, they would never, they wouldn't lend to first time real estate investors or they had to do like a certain amount of fix and flips. Yep. And I kind of thought that was ridiculous. And the reason why is like some of our best borrowers ever have always been first time real estate investors because they're so vested on su succeeding. Now, again, it's got to be the right person. Right. It can't just be like, oh, hey, I'm looking for 100 percent finance and I want to put any money into the deal. And I got crappy credit, but I found this deal on MLS. But not that I'm talking about, you know, they have a corporate job or if they live in the D.C. area, they have a government job. You know, they, yeah. And uh, they you know, which, which which is common. Exactly. They're hungry. They went through, you know, an expensive training program that they paid for, you know, bus tours, training programs, coaching, consulting. They've done that. They've already done all their due diligence. It's just a matter of finding a good deal. A lot of the times their deals aren't great, right? Because they're new and they're not, and they're not great. Like they don't, you know, they, they haven't put in like 10,000 hours of door knocking and, and cold calling and, and banded signs, but that's okay. They, they have a deal that they can still make margins on. And I get it. Their construction budget's going to be a little bit light because they don't realize their contractor is going to steal from them at some point. And then they got to find a new contractor. So like, but like, and, the, and these are things that like all the conversation with them. And I'm like, this is what's going to happen in reality, but that's okay. There's still enough margin for you, but they're, they're, they're willing to put in money. They're willing to put in time. And like, the way I look at it is if you're a killer in your current, in like your W2 job, or if you're a killer in something else, you're gonna be a killer in real estate investing. It's the same it's mindset. It's the same setup. Um, and if you're a schlep in something else, you'll probably be a schlep in this. So like, I love working with borrowers like that, mostly because like they're easy for us to capture because the institutional capital won't touch them, which is crazy. And you, you can buy their loyalty because you're the person that absolutely a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. A hundred percent. But it's funny because that's like the first thing be like, Oh, Hey, I'm calling around and you know, so-and-so won't give me money because I haven't done three flips. 
And I'm like, tell me a little bit about yourself. And like, that's character, right? Like, like forget collateral at that point. Let's just talk about your character. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I've had this job for 10 years, make $160,000. I'm whatever. I'm a professional title. You know, I went through this program. It's like, great, let's do it. Like, I can almost promise that they're going to succeed. And if, and, and if they don't succeed on the lender side, they're going to make us whole. Mm. Mm. No, I think, I think that's a, it's, it's very, uh, pe- I, I, I commend you for doing that because a lot of people, they just need to leg up and they need somebody to take a chance on them. And I think if, the, if they're a good judge of character with, I think there's a lot of good people out there. You can, they can really do some damage in the future and create, no doubt. create the life they want. And, Cause I, I think, I think the, I, and I see, I see what I see is that we, we see ourselves in them. Yeah. <laughs> you see yourself in them because you, you knew what it take to get started. So when you see somebody come around that has good character there, they have a will to, and gumption to succeed and they just need a little bit of help. Yeah. And, make- and, and, and they're not expecting you to like hold their, like they're not expecting, like a lot of people just have like, uh, what's the word? Like they're just having expectations. Like, oh, you should just do all this stuff. And it's like, yeah. no, you should do all this stuff, and you should want to learn to do this stuff, and you can do it. And you, you can usually tell pretty quickly by the way that they communicate via email or phone call, like very quickly. You know, you know how, how you know how they you know how they are and how they're going to perform. I mean, we've done thirty five hundred plus loans in the last sixteen seventeen years, and you know, serviced them all, and a lot of them have construction components. And I mean, I've talked to tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand prospects. So like, you know, firsthand, so like we always joke about it internally, like we almost know to a T the path that every one of our loans is going to go pretty much exactly how it's going to go. And some of them have speed bumps, you know, we'll do loans, you know, for real estate, inve- you know, for real estate investors that, you know, are not a plus, like, you know, they, they've got bumps and bruises and, you know, may, maybe low, maybe lower credit, maybe this, maybe that, uh, maybe they failed on a construction project. And, you know, we'll be more cautious, but like, you know, we, you know, we're, we don't, you know, it's funny because someone will be like, Hey, if, uh, you know, can I pay more to get higher leverage? You know, instead of three points, can I pay four points to get higher leverage or, and I'm like, our risk isn't, we're not a bank. Like your, your risk isn't based on, Hey, if I make an extra few thousand bucks, our risk is based on exposure, um, and, and loan, LT, you know, loan to value. So if a, if a borrower is riskier, let's just call it, we're just going to lend them less money. Yeah. They have to put more down. Yeah. And right. we'll make it up that way. Yeah. That, uh, one thing I love about like the, the lending game and the paper game is you can make the numbers work. That's right. For, for, for anybody, any, pretty much anybody, as long as they fit their, I think your four points that you, you kind of dive in. It's like, yeah. you can make, make it work for anybody. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we kind of had this thing internally that we don't turn down anybody. Like we just adjust based on where we're comfortable with. You know. And hey, you might buy a property for a million bucks. We only might only give you ten grand on it, <laughs> but but you know, like it might not be that extreme. But most of the time, that's kind of where it's at. Is we're just going to adjust based on risk. But over the last you know you know few years, we've also realized that character is such a big play. And if they're just going to be a pain in the neck, like it's just I like it's a partnership, right? Like I don't I, I don't want to I can't deal with it. Like our time is better used else elsewhere like i don't like I, I don't like some people just make the wrong decisions like some people have bad luck in life and yeah. they make the wrong decisions and i don't know why but like it's like that i mean we've we've had a friend and and um you know real estate colleague before that just everything touched just made the bad decisions about it i don't know why that was and like he just like it wasn't like he was a bad person or his intent was that but yeah. like, you know, he'd reach out to us and like pick our brain about something. And he's like, yeah, I was thinking about doing this. I was like, why? Like, that doesn't make sense. Well, I could do this. I'm like, just sell the property. You know, you're going to make $30,000 today or you're going to do all this work and heavy lifting to hopefully make $40,000, you know, in six months from now, hopefully. And that's if everything works out perfectly. So like, I don't know. Some people see it, I guess. Some people might, might not. Or it, it, you learn that as well, like over time. I think... And this is my point of view based off of that, that type of person. I think they, people, they are, they're on that path. And some people are shortcutted based off of what they know and experience and their, their individuality, but some people, they need to trip and fall for a long time. And right. they, they see it down the road. Like, and I don't know how long that road is. It's different for every person. 
Yep. <laughs> so that that road can go for years in time wise. <laughs> but I think I, I think I have hope that everybody eventually hits their goal down the down the line. Yeah. And I, I can't one, protect that. One of one of our offices early on, like this is an office we opened 10 years ago with our part with one of our partners. And early on we had a default that was somewhat of a bad default. And in essence, we could have continued to put throw good money at bad money. Or we were just like, let's just take this loss and just roll roll out. Like there's yeah. too much stuff. But like that hit him hard. And he was like, I'm he was like, I did a deal and I'm like losing personal money on this. It was a small amount of money, but it was still like, you know, you're not expected, like, hey, we get in business, you know, we're a for profit business. You know, you don't ever want to lose money on on a transaction. Yeah. But like, you know, it hit him hard and he's been cautious ever since, you know, just because like that's what woke him up, you know, woke him up or hit him. So have have you ever read the book, The Psychology of Money? No, that uh, I recommend that to all your listeners. It's so good. And uh, there's a guy named Morgan Housel. He just actually came out with a new book that I'm reading right now. It's called Same as Ever. But like the psychology of money is, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing because it's like, you, you know, you go by your past experiences. Like we're both going to look at a deal differently just based on, you know, our goals, uh, you know, moving forward and our experiences from the past. And that's just what, and, and that's how it is. And I don't know, psychology of money just ties, you know, it sums up everything, you know, how you look at a dollar, how you look at money, how you look at everything that, and it's, and it's like, you can't even like my takeaways wouldn't be relevant to you and your takeaways wouldn't be relevant to me. Yeah. But it, you know, there, there's like sub stories about like why people win the lot, why people play the lottery, because like a lot of like rich people know that the, that the odds are stupid. And you'll never win the, you know, you'll never win the lottery. So they don't play. They know it's a waste of money. But a lot of poor people play the lottery because they don't see a path to ever becoming a millionaire. It's not conceivable to them. So yeah. this is the one path that they can play that there is a possibility, even though it's very, very slim. So like, it's just filled of like amazing stories like that. So I'd rec so I'd definitely recommend that book. Yeah, I think that that equates to like um, people people putting their kids through sports because they feel like that's the only way to succeed. And yep. they're, they, drive, they drive down on sports because the only way you're going to make it out of this neighborhood is if you, yeah. if you become the best baseball slash basketball player out there. Same as win the lottery, the numbers. <laughs> and that's the, and I I I, I, told, I told you that. it's so crazy to me. It's so crazy to me. Um, yeah, I mean the ones at that level. I mean, I'm I'm a big advocate for youth sports. Um, you not necessarily. I'm realistic about actually professional or even playing at a collegiate level, but like, I, like I, I, I get those are small chances, but like there is, I, I do lo love the, you know, the sportsmanship, you know, being a, a part of a team, a community, brotherhood, sisterhood. Like, I think that is super, you know, super important. If, if that's something what it, you know, if, if a kid's into that. Kids that play sports become really good entrepreneurs. I think you're right. I think that makes sense. So I mean, a winner, I mean, listen, a winner is a winner. Like, that's not like a means thing to say, like, yeah. you know, I've got, you know, we, we, we have friends and people in our, in our sphere that are professional athletes at the highest level. Um, and like, I'm like, you can do whatever you want. You're retired, you know, you're a retired football player, you know, you're, it's like, just do whatever you want. Like you'll be successful. <laughs> like you put in the, you put in the 10,000 hours that you put into that, like you will be successful. You have it. It's just a matter of like what you want to do. <laughs> Are you guys set up as like a fund structure? We're not. The way that we do uh, all of our loans and, you know, at our size and our capacity, like you might think it's silly. It's just the way we've always done it is more like a direct placement model. So like okay. we'll, we'll, close, we'll close a loan for $100,000 and then we'll have a co-lending agreement with, you know, Jim Smith and wow. he'll buy the $100,000 note with us. And then we'll retain the servicing. So we, so everything closes under our name and we keep it that way. And, but like, you know, some people call it uh, direct placement. A lot of like inside private hard money lending companies call it like Tetris. Cause if you, you feel like you're always playing Tetris, it's like, okay, cool. I got a million dollars here and I got a million dollars of loans coming out. What capital is going into what? But honestly, it's the only way we know. We, we know it. It's what we've done for 16 or 17 years. And at this point, it's actually very, very easy. Like it just is. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and, and I know you mentioned, you know, we could talk about capital today compared to yesterday, you know, in the past, you know, in the future, you know, how it is raising it now compared mm -hmm. to the past, but like now, like the capital just raises itself and having that capital availability now and, you know, 
having the same investors, you know, for a long period of time that are, you know, investing in co-lending and deals with us, it, it, it makes life easy. Yeah. No, I, I've never, I've never heard of somebody doing like direct placement. Um, and depending on your volume, I would assume that's a big game of Tetris. Yeah, it, it can be. What, what state are you in again? Uh, I live in California, but we do a lot of stuff in Texas. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you can do it like this in California or not. I know California is obviously a lot more regular. I don't lend in California. There, obviously, there's a lot more regulations, lender license, broker license, probably a servicing license. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do know a few lenders, and I think they 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 might have it set up like that, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. So in essence, it's like a co you know co lending. Yeah. But it, I mean, it might sound sophisticate it might sound like it's labor intensive but there's pros and cons i mean so here's the thing like if you you know that there's pros and cons of a fund right the, the obviously the pro of a fund is let's say you have 100 deals outstanding you know you're one you know you're part of all those 100 deals and if one deal goes bad it's not really going to change any effect on the return because you're diversified into them yep the bad thing is you don't really have control over anything that's going into that fund or or, or have anything related to the deal when we started out it was kind of like a broker setup where it's like, you have $100,000. I don't have any money. I have a good deal. I will broker it to you and then I'll retain servicing for it. So we'll broker it to you. You wire the $100,000 in and then we'll retain the servicing and we collect the payments and make sure tax insurance. And then it's, it's become obviously a little bit more robust and sophisticated since then. Yeah. But it kind of stemmed from that. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I, I, it's cool, man. I'm I'm very intrigued how it works in the back end. I'm very very intrigued because I think it's a ha having a lot of capital, the, the capital stack on your fund on your on your money side. You have to kind of align all that stuff whenever. The Absolutely. I think it's cool. It's it's very cool. Um, what is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Um. It's a good question, and I used to have that quote on my wall until there was fire damage in the uh, office above us, and the sprinkler system came on, and when the fire department came in, that was part of the stuff that they cleaned up. So I don't exactly remember what it was, but it was something like this. It was a Warren Buffett quote that I got off the book, Snowball. Okay. And in essence, it was similar. I'm just going to paraphrase it because I, I don't really remember exactly how it goes, but it was... Uh, I'm always looking for a business, a business venture that can continue to, to deploy my, you know, my own, my own capital or company capital at very high rates of return and continue to do that over and over and over. It's, it, this is a hard operation or company to find, but if you find one, go all in with it, something like that. And that's, and that's in essence, what a hard money company can do. You can deploy money at, you know, high interest rates of return or higher than stock market or average rates of return, but you just got to have to keep feeding the machine and finding good deals over and over and over to do so. And I completely butchered that term, obviously. I'm going to find that quote because I, I think that's, that's, that's I'll find, I, I can find it. I have it somewhere because I, you know, in order, like in essence, like have you ever read that book, The Snowball by Warren Buffett? I'm, 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 not, I'm not a big reader. I'm really yeah, not. Audible. I don't know how to read. I know how to listen to audiobooks. <laughs> My, I don't know my, how to read either. <laughs> my 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 reading's very challenging. I mean, I've I mean, I've read very little physical books. Maybe never finished one, um, but I listen to a lot of audiobooks. And you maybe like four years ago, I I started heavy on that. So I usually can do like two books a month at this point, all on audio. And and I, I mean, as you start listening to books, you know, I I walk around my neighborhood in the morning. In essence, I just wander because I'm like ingrained in a book. Um, but like some people drive and listen to books wherever you can like absorb it. But I mean, I can bang out, you know, 45 minutes or an hour a day. And, you know, that get, you know, every two weeks that gets you through a book. Um, and it's, it goes a long way. You learn, I, like it's, that's been a big, a big, a big thing for me. I'm going to have to try that because um, I've been, I, the last book I read, I got the audiobook and I got the physical version. So I'm kind of like skimming yeah. while I was reading it to yeah, me. Yeah, that's what people say to do. So I, I did that. I did that in the last book I read, um, to trying to get like the best of both worlds. But I, I, yeah. I, I, it, I, well, here's the thing if it's, if it's something you're interested in, it's easy. If it's something you're not interested in or if the book doesn't work, start with psychology and money. I promise you. Start, read, buy psychology and money, psychology and money on Audible. 
if you can't get into that book, like you just lose interest, maybe reading is not for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think you'll uh, like th the reason why it's just, there's a lot of it's storytelling. You yeah. know, I, I heard this, I wrote down this quote. It wasn't a quote, but like something that I heard somebody say in an interview the other day. And I mean, I do a bunch of podcasts and I do a lot of content online and like people don't want to be lectured to, they want to be told stories. And mm -hmm. be, like, that's how you learn, right? I mean, I could tell you how to flip a house and the mechanics of all this for in 10 minutes, or I could just kind of story tell you of like, hey, this is how we did this deal. This is what I did to find that, you know, and then you turn it into a story and then people are engaged. And you know, that's also sales, right? Storytelling compared to lecturing. So a, a lot of, I like like biographies. I like stories. Like I, like that's easy. That's easy to listen to and absorb. Gotcha. Um, you have two podcasts that you do. Can you give us a little bit about those and where people can find those? So we do, so, so I have two podcasts for two diff, completely, totally different audiences. I have private lenders podcast with, uh, which I do with my business partner, Chris Haddon at Hard Money Bankers, where in essence, we help other private and hard money lenders throughout the country uh, grow their hard money lending operation. You know, there's, there's in essence, two types of folks in that business or in, in, in that uh, we, we have a, a mastermind group called the Hard Money Mastermind as well. Uh, that's related to that. But a lot of them are just folks that have their own capital and they're trying to just res responsibly deploy it into their own deals and learn how to do that. The other side of it are um, lenders kind of like us that they have their own money and they raise capital and they're trying to scale into a bigger hard money operation. And then I also have the Real Estate Reserve podcast that um, my friend Ian Horowitz and I host, and that's geared towards real estate investors. And uh, we talk about single family uh, real estate, we talk about self storage real estate, we talk about commercial real estate, multifamily real estate, anything kind of real estate investment focused. And that's a fun one. We I do them both weekly. Okay. All right. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I think this has been an amazing episode. I appreciate your time coming on, Jason. And absolutely uh, here, if you want to be a hard money lender, Go check out those podcasts. I think it's a great resource. And I think a lot of people, they can create a better ROI if they invest it, actively invest themselves. No doubt. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, if you're investing yourself actively, I mean, you should be making, you know, 100, you know, 100 plus percent on your capital, like very, very high. You know, if you're, I mean, that's a big difference between a passive and a capital, a passive and active. If you're a passive investor, you should be able to achieve, you know, eight, 10%, maybe 12%, give or take, depending on your deal. But as an active investor, you should be, you know, uh, hitting that out of the park. Out of the park. 100%. I agree with that. 100%. So for everybody here, go like, share, subscribe here, go like, share, subscribe. Thank you for coming. Hey, if you have any deals you'd like to submit to the Hive Mind and our team, go to hivebc.io. It's actually the Hive Buyers Club. Submit your deals and we can hopefully dispel your deal for you. Have a great day.